Um, so, and then of course, if anybody has any feedback um, at the end of the event, please email me and let me know um, because we always love to hear feedback. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Dr. Vincent Giampietro, who is a biomedical computer engineer and senior lecturer at King's College London. Um, and as we call him, the brain engineer. So, I'm going to come out to my screen, Vincent, so you can, uh, okay. you can use yours. And uh, um, no problem, just tell the other schools, I can take them another day. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's no problem there. Um, actually, I never know, do this uh, not enough? Uh, share, okay, share my screen. So you should see my screen now, hopefully. Yep. There okay. It is. Perfect. Okay, good morning, everybody. I guess I'll be starting. So I'll be taking your questions at the end so you can type them as we go along, but I'm, I'm only looking at them uh, at the end. Uh, so as Chris was saying, thank you very much, Chris, for inviting me again to talk today. Uh, so my name is Vincent and I'm a, a brain engineer uh, for the purpose uh, of today. So I'm going to explain to you in the next 10, 15 minutes uh, you know, my journey, if you want, uh, and, and what I do uh, in my job. Um, so that's me, so a caricature that somebody drew of me with a brain in my hand. So in my job, so as Chris was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher uh, at King's College London, which is one of the big universities in London. So uh, as a senior lecturer there, uh, I spend my time, I split my time roughly half-half between researching, researching the brain in my case, and teaching it. And I teach at all levels from undergraduate students, medical students, master's students. Uh, so in my day job, I try to understand how the brain works uh, and, and sometimes the brain goes wrong. And so me and my colleagues are trying to understand why it goes wrong and what we can do about it. Uh, so my journey uh, you know, for engineering, if you want, I, I studied in France and French uh, and uh, I studied generic engineering first. Then I was specialized after two years in computer engineering, which I didn't really like at the time. I mean, I'm talking 20 years ago. I didn't really like it. I wanted to do something a lot more practical. So I switched for what's called biomedical engineering, which, you know, you work as an engineer in the medical domain. This I really enjoyed. And of course, then you have a choice to make again about what you want to specialize in, in the medical domain. Uh, and I really, I was always fascinated by the brain, uh, by, you know, understanding who, who we are, how we think. Uh, so I really, I just specialize basically in biomedical engineering of the brain. Uh, so a brain engineer. Um, so I'm European in these, you know, in these really hard times of Brexit. I think it's worth spending you know, 30 seconds on this. So as I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm French, but my parents are Italian actually. So my, both my parents are Italian. I'm born and raised in France, just on the border of France, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, so in the heart of Europe. Uh, I studied in various places in France. Uh, then I went to study for a bit in Iceland. Then I came to, to finish my studies uh, in London, so I've, tra I've traveled a bit. And to complete the loop, if you want, uh, you know, I have married a, a Russian, so my children were born in the UK, they're French, Russian, English, uh, so basically, when you ask them what they are, they say they're European, and we're certainly staying here uh, because of Brexit. So back to back to the brain. So I work at King's College London. So as I said, one of the big universities in London. King's College got, uh, I think, nine or ten. Now I think this year it's ten different faculties looking at, for example, the business school, uh, you know, arts and humanities. I work in a bit of King's College London called the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience. So as the name suggests. We study psychiatry, so psychiatric disorders. So what's what's going wrong in the in the brain? Psychology, which is mostly in our case looking at trying to understand healthy brain, how the brain works when everything's fine, and neuroscience, which I'm going to tell you a bit more uh, in a minute. The specialty of the house, if you want, of our, of our faculty of King's College London, uh, we're really really interested in it studying all aspects of mental health. So we. This little tiny place where I work in the south southeast of London, we actually number two in the world for the research we do in psychiatry and psychology, just behind Harvard in the USA. Uh, so I'm a neuroscientist, so I'm not I study engineering, but myself and my colleagues, whatever we studied before, we call ourselves neuroscientists. So basically, you know, we study the brain. But the brain can be studied at lots of different levels. Neuroscience is a really, really vast 
field. So some of my colleagues are studying the brain at the cell level. So I don't know if you've learned yet at school about neurons, which are the cells which in your brain, if you want, which make you think. And here we can see neurons on, on the so they're not in the brain here, they're on a dish, on the plate. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, they're trying to attach to each other. And this is what's happening in your brain right now when you're listening to me, when you're learning new things. Your neurons are forming new connection uh, to hopefully uh, create some new memories of what I'm telling you about. So I am not working there, I'm not working with cells. Some of my colleagues are working with brains, with real brains. So here you can see one of my colleagues, Claire, and what she's holding in her hand is actually a real brain. Uh, I'm not working with brains like this either. My job is to look at living brain, you know, the brain in your head, in my head, using big machines to try to see what's happening in your brain when you're thinking. So we're using what I call MRI scanners. So some of you may have, have had an MRI scan in the hospital. For, for example, you can have an MRI of your leg or, or anything, but we're using the same machines which are in every hospital. We're using them to do research. So in the building where I'm sitting now, which is called the Center for New Imaging Sciences, we have three MRI scanners on the ground floor, which are, are used just for research. So what these, what these big scanners do, they create pictures of the brain, and these pictures are made up of loads of different uh, cubes of information, uh, which we call voxels, which are like the pixels on the phone. You, I'm sure, uh, may, I mean, if you're primary school, maybe not, but your big brothers or sisters, your parents, your teachers will have mobile phones. Uh, and, and when you take pictures, you know, these pictures have got like you know, 60 megapixels or something, which is all this little pixel of information, this little square of information that make up an image. If you put this in three dimension, we can create three dimensional objects like this brain here, this Lego brain. And this is what we get from these big MRI scanners. So it takes about a couple of minutes to scan a brain. Uh, and we can do different things with it, depending on what we want. So basically, mostly we're looking at our brain anatomy. We're looking at the structure of the brain. Or we're looking at the function of the brain, how the brain works. So I'm just going to show you here a couple of movies and pictures of what we can do with an MRI scanner when we look at brain anatomy. What you can see on the left here, uh, sliding, it's, it's a picture of the brain. This is what the doctors would be using to diagnose problems with people's brain. But you're reusing them for research to see what's different in brain anatomy between healthy people and people who've got some brain, brain disorders or uh, some of my colleagues are studying uh, just development. So they would be scanning your brain, your little brother's brain, your little brother and sister's brain, your big brother and sister's brain, your parents' brain, your grandparents' brain, to see what's happening to the brain when we age. So if I stop this one uh, somewhere, there's a really nice bit which I like. I don't know how it looks on your screen, uh, but this is right at the bottom of, of the brain. The brain is just starting here, but you can see the eyes, there. So we're looking, at, we're looking from the top. You can see the eyes. You can see the nose, the cartilage in the nose. And this, I don't know if you see it on your screen, but here you can see a little like spiral, which is actually in your ears. Uh, so doctors would be using this uh, and they will be looking for things going wrong in the brain. What you can see on, on the right here, it's a brain uh, you know, turning, turning from the sides like this. And we're looking at the blood vessels in the blood arteries in the brain. Again, doctors would be using this to look at, for example, at something called stroke, which is something that you know, elderly people will get a lot when you have some blockage in, in, in your brain, in the vein or arteries of your brain. So the doctors will be looking at this to see if there's anything missing because there could be a blockage in the brain. The two pictures at the bottom, uh, we're looking at something called the white matter in the brain, all the connections in the brain. And again, we're using all of these for research uh, or uh, in the clinic. So the two images at the bottom, for example, the brain surgeons are using these a lot as well. So this is we're looking at brain anatomy using an MRI scanner. I mean, there, there are lots of different types of equipment we could be using to look at the brain, but I'm really focusing today, and my job actually focuses on using these big uh, MRI scanners. So brain structure, it's great, but most of what I do is to study brain function. So we, what we want to do is we want to you know, understand what's happening in your brain when you're listening to me 
or when you're playing a game or when you're reading or when you're doing an experiment. So the way we do this, we make you lie down in the MRI scanner and then you do an experiment. So this is just a picture from one experiment, for example, what is called a mental rotation task, where you would have some, uh, some figures like this on the screen and you would have to decide by pushing buttons, uh, you would have to decide if the figure you see on the left and on the right are the same one rotated uh, or if it's a different figure, if it's two different objects or the same object rotated. So basically what you've got to do here, you have to try to mentally, without moving, you have to rotate, you have to move this object in your mind, you have to make it turn to see if it fits. And what's really interesting with this kind of experiment, for example, is that the further apart the two objects are, so the more you have to rotate them in your mind, the slower you are. So if they're really close to each other, it's really quick for you to decide, but the further apart, the further rotated they are, uh, the more time it takes you. So basically you are really in your head, really moving them. So we're trying to see what's happening when you're trying to do this. So you're doing the experiment, you're pushing the buttons. And at the same time, we take a picture of your brain activity. So using the MRI scanner, more or less every second. Every second, we see what's happening in your brain. So we see what, we know what's on the screen. We know what button you're pushing. Every second, we take a picture of your brain. And then using mathematics or statistics, it's called, uh, and using big groups of people, we produce images like this. So here we're looking at someone, we're looking from the back, it's like the, the camera is at the back here. Uh, so you can see the ears, these are the ears of the person. Uh, here they're looking at something on the screen and we see which bit, sorry I'll start it again, and we see which bit of the brain are being activated when you're looking at different pictures. So that's what, what my job is, to try to understand what's happening in your brain and what's different between people who, you know, who are healthy and people who have various brain disorders. So that's great, but what do engineers do when working in new imaging? I mean, new imaging is really, really multidisciplinary. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a building called the Center for New Imaging Sciences, but if I just think about just all the people I've seen this morning, for example, when I was making myself a coffee, I saw some nurses, some doctors, some engineers, I saw some uh, computer guys, I saw some psychologists, uh, so we are working together. So it's not just one person doing all of this. It's a big group of people working together with lots of different specialties. But if we think specifically about the engineer, so what do, what do we do? So some of my colleagues are dealing with the, you know, the hardware, so the physical aspects of engineering. So they are, for example, you know, the MRI scanner itself and all the equipment which goes with it have been designed by engineers. So we don't really touch this because we bought the MRI scanner. Uh, but of course, the people who make the scanners in all these other companies, they are all engineers or physicists. Uh, some of the engineers, that's why my role uh, is, I'm on the software side. So I write the computer program to analyze the data. So in my case, I am at the end of the process, which is writing software to analyze data. But some of my colleagues, you know, next door, are actually writing software, but not to analyze the data, but to acquire data. They're writing software to make the scanner work better or faster, or to make it do different things. Uh, some of my colleagues downstairs on the second floor, they are actually, you know, building equipment. So they're engineers as well, but their job uh, is to build the equipment we're going to need uh, in the scanner because the MRI scanner is a big magnet, a massive magnet, uh, really strong magnet like the ones we've got lifting cars. You know, I don't know if you've seen these magnets in, on cranes in junkyards. So you cannot just buy equipment and bring it to the scanner. So we have to make our own. Uh, so for example, they are building button boxes. So these are various, you can see top left, various button boxes to move various joysticks or things to click. Uh, what you see on the right here is, a, is an apparatus which was built for an experiment uh, looking uh, at pain. So specifically in this case, uh, looking at osteoarthritis. So this is a disease that maybe a lot of your grandparents or great grandparents would have. When you become old, your, your joints in your fingers, it's mostly in your fingers, uh, the joint start to hurt. Uh, and we or start to get really stiff and we're really trying to understand not exactly what's happening in the hand but what's happening in the brain in our case when people are experiencing pain here so this is an apparatus that would push on the joint to inflict a spe specified amount of pain to study what's happening in the brain the one you see at the bottom right it's another thing which my colleagues have built which is for the same 
same patients, people, people who have osteoarthritis, uh, this simulate turning a key, which is something we do all day, every day, you know, holding a door, opening a door handle. But if you have pain in your, in your joints and that pain never goes away, you know, I mean, you can manage it a bit with painkillers, but you get used to, pain, to the painkillers. So the pain is still there. So what's really interesting for my colleagues studying pain is that, you know, people who've got this disease, they already start having the pain before they even turn the key as they approach their hand because they know it's coming they already start feeling it so we're studying we have a big group here studying pain and this is just one tiny example the one you see on the left here uh, as you can see my colleagues have taken a recycling bin uh, and then they put lots of lots of tubes and things in it and this is for an experiment about smelling in this case all the different tubes have got different smells and then uh, you know you can see what, uh, one of our students here she's just sniffing all these different smells so what we would do here we would put her in the MRI scanner and see what's happening in her brain when she's smelling nice things or disgusting things what's different in the brain uh, so another actually the same people who build all this equipment they're actually designing writing the software to run the experiments so this is just some experiments, for example. So the one you can see on the top left, it's an experiment you would use in a virtual reality setting uh, where you have to remember where you are. So you see there's a different platform, different color, and you have to navigate and remember where you were at the beginning. So this is a memory experiment when you have to use what's around you. You have to remember, oh yeah, I was on the left of the castle. Uh, on the top right so it didn't start on its own this is a much simpler experiment where you just have a joystick and you have to follow the numbers you just have to follow the numbers in order this seems you know really easy to you uh, but it may be really difficult for some of our patients who have you know problems with their brain or for some patients who have problem moving their hands uh, for them it would be really hard so we're trying to see what's happening in their brain uh, bottom left now I think if it starts this is a completely different type of experiment when we're looking at people buying things. So we can see here, you see a little cross moving in the middle. This is where the person is looking. We're doing something called eye tracking at the same time. So we, we filmed in a supermarket and we've made an experiment in a supermarket and we see where the person is looking. So there's no button to push. We're just trying to understand why somebody would buy one product rather than another product. If it's to do with the price, if it's to do with the color of the packaging, if it's to do where it is on the shelves. And finally, uh, there's another experiment which is on the bottom right. This is some of my own work where we, we, I'm doing something called neurofeedback where you're playing a video game with your brain. So you're not, you don't have any controllers, you're in the MRI scanner and your mission, if you want, is to make this character, so I start it again, you have to make this character go as high as possible. The higher he goes, the more points you get and the more points you get, the more money you get at the end, real money. Of course, uh, people doing the experiment don't know that at the end they all get the same amount of money. If they, even if they can't do it, they still get the money. We, we don't tell them that at the beginning. And why do we doing this? We, 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 we're using this at the moment to evaluate a new treatment for ADHD. I don't know if you've heard about ADHD, maybe some of your friends have ADHD. So it's, it's usually a, a, a condition which is managed by taking medications. So we're trying a completely non-medicated treatment. There. We're doing what's called a clinical trial to evaluate if, if it works basically at all. Uh, so it's a big five-year project. We, we, we've scanned about 70, 70 children uh, now and we have to go up to 100 and then it take a couple of years to evaluate to analyze the data so I hope that I've been able to show you in you know in 10-15 minutes the richness of what a brain engineer can do we can work in loads and loads of different fields and I've just shown you my little corner of neuroscience but we can find engineers at all the different levels of neuroscience as well so that's it for my talk thank you very much for listening to me uh, and I'll just be answering your questions now. Lovely, thank you, Vincent. Um, brilliant once again. Thank you. Oh, get the credits up, that's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's really important when you use pictures from other people, you have to see it is, where it's you true. take them from. Yeah. It's true. Okay, guys, so if, uh, if um, anyone has any questions for uh, Vincent, could sorry, you please? I'm just, I'm just trying to bring the uh, uh, chat, okay. Okay. Um, oh, we haven't yet moved on to main full screen here.
Yep, All right, so yeah, I'll go back. If anyone has any questions for Vincent, could you um, please just type them in to the, the chat facility? And as I said, Vincent will read them out and give his responses. What should I put on the screen? Or I'll just put. Okay, uh, just put the first. Or let's put this one. Sorry, let's put this. Okay, so first questions from Isla Primary School. Good morning. Uh, what's the worst case you have worked with? Well, it depends what you mean by worst case. I mean, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't really see, uh, I don't really see patients myself. I, I see their brain, if you want. Um, uh, what's the worst case? Well, the worst case. Okay, I can tell you what the worst images I've seen. But it's actually there's actually nothing wrong with the, the person in the scanner, but sometimes. Uh, uh, there's something going wrong with the equipment. So there's nothing wrong with the person in the scanner. But when we look at the images, for example, I remember looking at images sometimes, and there's nothing. There's just a neck, and there's no head. Clearly, we know there's a head, because we know there's somebody in the scanner. But we, when we look at the images, we don't see a head. And this is usually because, you remember I was telling you before that the scanner is a big magnet. So the way it works, I mean, it doesn't really matter for today, but it's all based on, on magnetic fields. And if you've got something in, in your head, for example, if you've forgotten to take out some of ear, some air clips, so some of the girls come with lots of hair clips, so we have to take them out one by one. But if you forget some hair clips, what can happen is this distorts the images so much that it looks like there's big holes in the head, or there's no head at all sometimes. So that would be the worst case I've seen, some, some, somebody without a head, even if they actually had a head, just the image and no head. Uh, Eton Primary School, how long does it take to become an engineer? Uh, well, I did study in France, but of course I know the system here uh, as well. So you would have to go through, I guess, for university, so you would have to do some, you know, some science-based, uh, you know, uh, A-levels or GCSE and A-levels, then you have to go to university to study engineering or computer science, I mean, depending on what you want to do, I think it's separated here, uh, but you would do, uh, you know, like three years, three years to get an undergraduate degree, four years to get, and then another, an extra year if you want a master's, and, and, and it really depends, if you want to work in a university, be an engineer in a university, usually you would need a PhD, you need to become a doctor of engineering, which is another four years, so that's what, as I said, three, so that's probably like you know, 10, 11 years in total. But you don't have to have this PhD, you don't have to be a doctor of engineering to work as an engineer in a company. Usually three years of university, three, four years of university, uh, you know, is, is probably uh, enough uh, for that. Um, so what is like being a brain engineer? Uh, what is the UC? So I like Priming's primary school. Uh, so being a brain engineer, it's, it's great because, you know, I really love the topic. I think I'm doing something useful and I think my colleague would argue as well. It, it, I mean, that's the reason why I specialize in the brain as well, rather than to be a, a knee engineer or a lung engineer, because I, I think it's really fascinating to try to understand, you know, what's going on with, in our brains. Uh, and what's great with the job of, of you know, working in, in these settings, in the university setting, is we always, we do loads and loads and loads of different things. Of course, not everything works. I've got, you know, I was just presenting to you uh, some nice pictures of things which work, but a lot of what we do just doesn't work. And that's really interesting as well. When you can spend, you know, a year working on something that doesn't work, but you learn a lot from it. So we learn a lot. You never stop learning. You never stop doing experiments uh, and, and you never stop having fun. Uh, so what is ADHD? Well, that, that's a disease that makes you hyperactive, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, it's, it's, it makes you inattentive, hyperactive. So it, it's, it's a condition which, which a lot of children suffer from these days. Uh, usually you would take some medications to, 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 to calm you down, to help you to focus. Uh, so what we are trying to do, what, if you wanted to know what exactly is happening in the brain, I mean, it's, it's, we're not 100% sure, of course, but we know, for example, in, in our work, we know that there's a specific network in the brain, so the way some brain regions talk to each other, but, but it's less efficient, works a bit slower when you have ADHD uh, than, in, but, than when you don't have ADHD. So we're trying to do using this video game is to train these brain regions to respond more. We know that when people take medication, the effect of the medication is to what we call normalize this brain activity, to make this brain network work as well as when you don't have ADHD. So what we're trying to do is to do the same thing without giving medication. Um, so that's what we'll be doing, and it's quite promising. 
uh, Eton Primary School, what made you want to become an engineer and do you like it? Uh, I mean, I've always been, uh, you know, since I was probably your age, if you're all in primary school, I've always been really interested in, in science. I've always, I always knew I wanted to do something with science. Uh, and I always knew I didn't want to do medicine uh, as well. Uh, so I think I just naturally ended up uh, towards uh, engineering. I've always been really interested in understand how things work. I've never been the kind of uh, child who used to disassemble everything to understand how the machines work. I've never been interested in that. I was more, when I was a child, more, more, a lot interested in the biology of things and fascinating by just animals and insects and, and, and things like this. Uh, so I guess I just followed through and ended up uh, being an engineer. Uh, uh, yeah, I really like my job. I mean, like, like every, every work, you know, there's ups and downs, you know, some days are better than others, but I would say it's, it's mostly, mostly good. Uh, of course, it's not all exciting. Uh, you know, we are, we, you know, some part of our work is really boring. Uh, like there's lots of, you know, more and more actually paperwork to do. Uh, I'm sure your teacher will understand us. There's lots of marking to do, you know, look, we have to do lots of students. They have lots of, they do lots of essays, lots of exams, and we have to mark all of this. So that's certainly not the best part or the most fun part of the job, but it's interesting teaching. It's interesting seeing your students develop, uh, despite the fact that there's the boring side of, of the teaching. Uh, what's the favorite part about your job? I think I think it's probably a said earlier because but it changes every day. I mean, you, you, you okay, of course, we know roughly what, we, what we're doing, but there's no two days the same. Some days you're teaching all day, some days you're in meeting all day, some days you're just writing new research, thinking about new research with colleagues, uh, meeting lots of colleagues from all over the world, traveling. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of different parts of the job which makes it, you know, you know to be, you know, it just stays interesting because you don't do the same all the time. Uh, so yeah, I'm still finishing this question from Eton Primary School. How hard do you have to work when you're an engineer? Well, I guess I would say like in every job, I mean, you have to work as, as hard as, as you can to, to get the best, to do the best job possible. Uh, uh, I mean, working in a university is slightly different. I guess if you're an engineer uh, more in, in a company or in industry and in university is different because in universities, we have a tendency, a tendency to work uh, all the time. So we, you know, which is bad, which is bad. Uh, we have to, you know, we're working evenings, holidays, weekends, but it's just because we, we love our work so much, but we, we're finding, finding it really hard to stop. Uh, luckily, we, you know, this is why my family, my wife, my children force me in a good way. Uh, to stop working a bit. Uh, Isla Primary, so I don't know if I say Isla Primary or Isla Primary, so I'll say Isla Primary from now on. Uh, apologies if it's the other way around. How many neurons are in the brain? Oh, there's billions and billions and billions of neurons uh, in the brain. So I didn't say millions, I said billions. And these are just the neurons. There's a lot of other types of cells uh, in the brain as well that connects all the neurons that just like are caring for the neurons. So I think people clearly say that you know there, there's more neurons in one brain than, than you've got you know galaxies in the universe. So our brain is the most complex thing. One brain is the most complex thing in the universe. Uh, a really good question again for my lab probably would the magnets in the MRI scanner damage the brain? So no, so the magnet itself doesn't damage the brain. Uh, MRI scanners have existed since the 1980s, uh, like you know, 40, 50 years now, I guess, depending when, you, when it started. Uh, and there's been lots of studies looking at long-term effects, especially for people who work next to the magnet. So there's no problem uh, with the magnetic field being, you know, being in the magnet next to the magnet. But there's no issue, no health issues there, but it could be dangerous if you have any metal in your body. If you've had surgery, for example, and you've had a metal, uh, you know, metal plate in your head, or if the surgeon they use some types of screws, if you had surgery now, it wouldn't be an issue because they all, 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 you know, all the equipment they use is usually uh, non-ferromagnetic, so you wouldn't be attracted by magnets. But maybe if somebody like one of your grandparents had surgery a long time ago, uh, they could, they could be a problem there. So this is why, uh, uh, for me, uh, for example, as a researcher. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, testing my participants for this. We have dedicated NHS radiographers, they call, we are operating the scanners, and they would go, before anybody enters the room of the scanner, they would go for a long interview with you to make sure 
uh, they would just uh, tick, tick lots of boxes uh, to make sure you have an ad, you, there's no risk for you. And because they're there, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have any accidents basically because their job is to make sure that the person going to a scanner is safe. We don't decide as researchers, they decide. So even if I've got a research participant coming, I really want to scan them. If the radiographers say no, I cannot scan them. How many years have I worked in my job? Well, I've been in the UK for about 20 years now, 22 years, I think. So I would say about 22 years. I mean, I came as a student and then I did my PhD here to become a doctor, but I was working uh, alongside. So I've been working in that field, if you want, in brain imaging for about 20 years. And I've seen the field progressing so much. It's amazing what we can do now compared to what we could do when, when I started. Uh, Eton Primary School, how is your job different to being a doctor? So yeah, that's a good point. So I've got a, what's called a PhD, so I'm a doctor of engineering, but I'm not a medical doctor. So I'm not looking at patients, I'm not diagnosing diseases. So my job is to produce the images, which we then give to the doctors to look for problems. So I don't look for problems, I just, of course, sometimes it's obvious, uh, but even then, I wouldn't know, my job is not to decide anything, I pass the images to the doctors, uh, would be able to diagnose the problems and then decide on, on, on treatment. Isla Primary School, is it hard work? So I think I've said before, it's as hard as you want it to be uh, in a way, but you should always work hard. Um, uh, Eton Primary School, what kind of people do you work with in your job? I think I was, I was, I mentioned it before, there's, there's you know, everybody, new imaging is really, really, multidisciplinary so just to give you an idea so in a new imaging projects like the, the one you saw earlier to, when we did an, you do an experiment so we start if it's an experiment involving patients we would have depending on the patients we would have psychiatrists or neurologists or clinical psychologists recruiting the patients so they would be would be their study and then we would have regular psychologists designing the experiment and then we would have uh, engineers building the equipment, you know, uh, writing the software to make the experiments. And then when we scanning, so we, we have physicists, medical physicists, so they, they are the ones programming the scanner or making the scanners do new things. We have on the day, we have radiographers, NHS radiographers, who are pushing the buttons and doing the interviews and taking care of, of our research participants, of our patients. If you've got patients involved, we would have some nurses and some doctors, some medical doctors there on site. And then after scanning, you have another batch of engineers who write all the software needed to analyze the data, mathematicians, statisticians, so basically anybody with a science degree can, can work with us. And not just science, we've had some of my colleagues have got backgrounds in sports studies, sports science, for example, because they really understand, they're trying to understand these are in the pain group. People have got, uh, some, of, some of our pediatricians have got a background in sports science, so we are trying, trying to understand you know, back pain in the context of physiotherapy. We've got, I've got colleagues who've studied linguistics because they're really interested in language, trying to understand language in the brain. So basically, you know, everyone can work with me. How many people, so ILA Primary School, how many people do we scan in a day? Uh, so it takes about, okay, for, for clinic, when you go to the hospital to have an MRI scan, it takes about half an hour to have a scan. For us, when we, you come to do research, it takes usually an hour. So you would stay in a scanner for about an hour, we would do like four or five different experiments when, when you're in a scanner and we would take all these images of your brain anatomy as well. So, uh, so it's about an hour for one person and we scan really, we scan all day. We start usually scanning at eight in the morning and we finish at seven in the evening and we scan on Saturdays and Sundays as well. And this is just for research. So we do have a lot, we're doing mass, you know, if you want, it's, it's mass production of, of, of uh, MRI scanning. So we have a big database with all the scans, we've acquired and there's hundreds of thousands of people out there. Uh, what age of people do you scan the brain? That's a really good question. So at the place where I work, uh, we do scan uh, mostly adults to elderly and, and teenagers. Uh, and I, I would say from 10 years old, we scan here for research purposes. Of course, across the road in the hospital, they scan everybody, including babies. King's College, there's another bit of a university, another bit of King's College London at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, which is next to Big Ben in London. There, they specialize in scanning babies uh, and, and little children and babies and even fetuses. So they can, we can now start scanning children before they're born. 
and we can always do it. We can always do experiments when your baby is still in, in the mother's belly. We can do experiments, of course, involving sounds, for example. So some of my colleagues are trying to understand how early or early can babies detect emotions, for example, in people's voices by playing people crying, people laughing, you know, different voices uh, to babies still in their mother's belly and to try to image what's happening in the brain of the babies. Uh, how long do you stay in the scanner for? So I said about usually about an hour. What does it feel like being scanned? That's a good question. I mean, you saw the picture earlier of the scanner. Okay, I can't go back to it. It's like a big tube. So what it feels like, it, it feels cramped. So you should, you know, you should not be claustrophobic. Uh, you should not be afraid to be in cramped spaces. Uh, we usually would practice before we scan you uh, in a fake. We have a fake MRI scanner for practice. Uh, it's usually uh, really loud as well. Uh, so you would have some earplugs plus some headphones. Uh, so uh, for the length of the scan, you've got like bing, 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 bing sounds for about an hour. So it's not a great, I mean, it's nothing, it's not dangerous. It doesn't hurt. You don't feel, physically, you don't feel anything. Uh, but it's just a bit weird, basically. Uh, but uh, some of our students in the building are working on, on new scanning technologies, which will make the scanner completely quiet. So, so you know, uh, in, I would say in the next five years, MRI scanners will be completely quiet. And in this building, next year, we're getting a head-only MRI scanner where you just put your head in rather than going all the way in. So it will, it will be much easier to be scanned. Uh, Eton Primary School, what well, has been your favorite moment as an engineer so far? Um, it's a hard one, this one. Because in a way, every time you finish a project, every time you have some nice results, it's your best moment until the next one or until the next thing goes wrong. Well, uh, or talking to you is, is a great moment. I, I love being able to, to, you know, to, to pass on my knowledge to you, to hopefully try to inspire you. And I would say that you know, in the last couple of years, uh, when Chris tells me that some of the entries for the uh, engineering, you know, for what you're doing now, so, so some of the children who've been listening to me have cited me as an inspiration. That makes me really proud and one of my best moments, uh, rather than the experiments themselves. Uh, have you ever had your own brain scanned? Uh, yes, yes, we a lot. <laughs> we uh, we usually joke about it. We say we do a checkup once a year. Basically, we we always help each other. Uh, we, we scan each other uh, because there's a special ethics, so we're not allowed to scan no, everybody just for fun. But there's a special condition when we can scan each other when we are designing new experiments or things like this. So yeah, usually about once a year. Uh, but some of my colleagues who do medical physics, the physicists, they go. They, you know, some of them just go nearly every day you know, in the scanner. Oh, interesting question from Eton Primary School about do you have any disagreement with your colleagues about your work and research? Yes, all the time. Uh, uh, and it could be small disagreement or it could be a big disagreement. So uh, we usually, you know, we're all adults and something you learn for your school by working in groups. You know, when it's, you know, when you do group projects at work, it's the same. Not everybody agrees. Not everybody is happy. But it's something you, you have to learn how to deal with these, you know, these difficult situations. And of course, we all have disagreement. And sometimes you think you're right about something until you know the other people tell you that they demonstrate to you why you're wrong, and you have to admit, yes, okay, I was wrong about it, and then you just move on. Sometimes you still disagree, but you still have to work together because you know the project is more important than the disagreement. So you have to learn to to move on. From dis you dis we're disagreeing. Let's agree to disagree, and we just move on. We still work together. We don't have to fully agree to still work together. Sometimes we have big disagreement, especially at, uh, you know, uh, in research, when you're competing with other research groups. This is where you could do, you could do a fantastic research uh, experiment, and you spend a long time doing it, and you write what you think is a beautiful paper, scientific paper, and you send it to a journal, and they just disagree. They say it's rubbish. Uh, so this is hard, and then you have a bit of a fight back and forth. Uh, but that's quite rare. Most of the time, you know, people know how to work with each other. And when, even when you disagree, I said, it's not the end of the world. You just agree to disagree and you move on. Uh, oh, a really interesting question from Ayla Primary School. Would the sound of an MRI scanner interfere with the brain scan results? So that's a really good question. So when we're studying brain anatomy, of course, there's no impact on the sound. But when we're trying to study brain function, yes, the sound uh, has an impact. But 
the sound is there all along. The sound never stops. So when we analyze the data uh, at the end, we can take out the sound because it's there. It's a constant in the images. But of course, uh, it limits what you can do in terms of experiments involving sound. So if you're trying to play music or play voices or everything like this, it's, it's quite hard because you've got this added noise all the time. This is why everybody is really, really excited about this new generation of MRI scanners coming soon, which should be completely silent. We will be able to do much, much more interesting experiments involving language and sound and music. I mean, we can always, we can already do it, but it will be so much easier afterwards. Uh, Eton Primary School, have you ever seen a work with a real brain? So I've seen a brain, like I was showing you a picture at the beginning of my colleague, uh, Claire. So I've been to visit a facility. So we have a, she worked in what's called a brain bank. So we have a brain bank at King's. There's one, there's various ones in, in London in other universities. This is where people who died are donating their brain for medical research. So we, we keep them in what's called a brain bank. So they're frozen there and researchers can, can use them. So yes, yeah, so I've been there with my students uh, and I've seen brain, but in my work, uh, I don't need that. My work, I just image uh, you know, living. Uh, ta -ta -ta. So Isla Primary School, looks like it's the last questions. Is there, for now, is there anything you cannot do the day before having an MRI scan? Um, no, not really. It's, it's not like it's not like an operation. You know, it's not like surgery where they tell you not to drink or not to eat before coming to a surgery. There's nothing specific about an MRI scan. Maybe don't drink too much water because you don't want to go in the toilet in the middle. But it's fine. You can just go before. I mean, you don't stay long. You stay half an hour, maybe an hour for research. But just in case, you know, don't drink don't drink two liters of water just before. Uh, but of course, depending on the experiments you're doing, uh, you may have, you know, you may be able to do or not do things. For example, if people are studying, uh, some of my colleagues are studying eating disorders, so maybe you would have some specific instructions, for example, not to eat for 12 hours before. But this is not because of the MRI, it's because of a specific experiment, because then they're going to give you food or make you smell food, for example. So they want everyone to be responding in the same way because they cannot control when you're having your breakfast or something like this. So they would say, okay, don't eat before so that everybody can react in the same way. Other experiments, sometimes we tell people, you know, don't drink coffee you don't, or don't smoke cigarettes before coming, for example. Again, it depends on, on the specific of the experiments. Uh, Isla Primary School, is there any, oh, no, so I've read this. Uh, what if you get a headache while having a scan? Okay, it's a good idea. Uh, good question. Uh, so when you're having a scan, you have an emergency buzzer, uh, which is usually just a, a ball, just that you can squeeze if you want to get out, and you would get out immediately. Uh, so they would come in, the radiographers would come in, because you're, you're usually you're alone in the room, except if, depending on the experiment, sometimes there's a nurse, if they, if they need to take some of your blood or something like this, there may be someone with you. If children are scanned, you may have your parents with you. Uh, but, but as soon as you say you, do, you want to get out, somebody comes in to get you out. So you know, they're not, you know, there's no point you staying in a scanner if you don't want to be scanned or if you, are, uh, if you have a headache or if you're coughing, for example. That's happened to me once. I, was just, I just had a cold and I started coughing so much I had to come out. You know, when you have tickle cough, I just couldn't stay uh, in the scanner, couldn't stay lying down. Uh, so yes, you, you, you would come out immediately. So what, what we're doing to, pre to preparing for this, uh, I mean, we can't control, of course, we cannot control if you have a headache or, or if you're coughing or something like this. But what we can control, for example, is the surprise element to make sure you're quite comfortable. So this is why we would practice using a fake. So we have an MRI scanner. It's the same size and everything. It looks the same, but it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. It's just an old one. So this is one where you would practice lying down. You may even practice the experiment just to make sure that the day you have your real scan, you do not panic because of the novelty of it. So at least you would have, you would be used to it. And I think that's my last question. Okay, I've got one for you, Vincent. Oh, so yeah? sorry yeah. Off of that, but would, would the headache show up on the MRI? Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, some of my colleagues, I'm just pointing this one out, down, down there in another building, they are actually studying uh, headaches. They're studying headaches, they're studying migraines, uh, studying how it, migraines moves in the brain, propagates in the brain. So I would say yes, if you were looking for it, if that's what you were scanning for, 
uh, you would you would use a specific way of scanning that would show you what's happening when you have a headache. But yes, so we wouldn't do an experiment. The way we would do this is, is slightly different. We would still scan your brain activity, like take a picture of your brain every second, but you would you, but you're not doing anything. You're just lying there, just thinking, resting. And then when you have your headache, you would tell us, you would push a button or something to, to tell us, now I've got a headache. And then the people would look at what's different in the brain at rest, because you're resting, you're not doing anything, by compare, comparing what's happening before the headache and when you're having the headache, people could try to see which parts of the brains are driving the headache. So yes, some of my colleagues are doing this. And we're working a lot with drug companies uh, to test new, new drugs, for example, new medications. And we've got some really, really promising, uh, we're doing a really promising clinical trial at the moment for new types of headache or migraine drug. So that's, which is really, really promising. Thank you, excellent. Um, okay, guys, so we, any more questions for Vincent? Because uh, if not, we can um, call it a day. Yep. So, so that will, thank you very much. I, 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 I'd be terrified in, in uh, an MRI scan for, for an hour. Um, that's easy. I've, I've had a couple, and uh, they, they're, they, they're very claustrophobic to me. Yeah, so, so can you imagine? Yeah. So you, you'll be much better when we have these new ones. Where yeah. you, just put, you still have to lie down. So it's not something, well, it's not like the big hairdressing thing. You still have to lie down, but at least you just put your head in, yeah. uh, and it will be quiet. So it will be so much better. Brilliant. Especially when we are trying to study anxiety, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so thank you, everybody. I, well, we'll, we'll close the meeting down. Um, oh, thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan, from the school. Yeah, thank you, Ethan, and, and thank you, Isla. Isla. Um, okay, it was Isla. It was Isla, okay. yeah. Um, and um, as I say, if you have any feedback, please send it to me, um, and I'll, I'll pass it on to Vincent. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, just ask Chris, and then he yeah. will send them to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm going to close the meeting down now, and I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully get to an e email to you, Vincent. Um, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll out. take, I'll take, I can take the other schools whenever soon. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to close okay. it down. Bye bye, now. everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.